<laughs> Would Saturday be a better day? Yeah? <laughs> yeah, that's well. Yeah, he well he needed to do that because the other class was having a Sunday review. All right. Well, it is start time, so let's get started. And I'll start with just a quick announcement, the same thing that I hope you already know. Uh, you've got a test coming up, right? And so uh, I'll talk for about 10 minutes and then pass out the test, and we'll get started. No. Uh, when is your test? Wednesday. Yeah, next, next Wednesday here. So one week from today. So... As I mentioned at the end of class last time and going to continue, the idea today is do some examples using these new ideas of energy, conservation of, of energy. And so we'll do some from chapter seven. We already got started. I think we did like one and a half. We were halfway through a problem, so that's where I want to pick up. And we'll just do more from chapter seven and you'll see the, the whole principle. Then we'll jump into chapter eight. Uh, maybe that means today or maybe that doesn't mean till Monday, but in either case, we'll do Monday again more examples. So keeping this in mind, there's no new physical principles between now and the next test. Your job, your responsibility is to make sure you learn all these and so you are ready for the exam next uh, Wednesday. Um, in addition to the normal class, which would be today and um, Monday, we have a Friday MC and a review on Saturday. A uh, Sunday, excuse me. And so make sure you catch this and, and write it down. Always highly encouraged though. So this Sunday, 1 to 4, be here on campus. Good chance to, to go over with, with Don. And so between, you know, the examples today, uh, your chance to meet with Don on Friday, your chance to meet with Don on Sunday, your chance to be back here on Monday. Uh, even Monday's lab is a conservation of energy one. In fact, one of the example problems I have for you is the same type of problem you'll do in the lab. It's a good energy problem. Uh, and so it's a good, a, good, a good one to do right before the exam. And so between all those, I think you have plenty of opportunities uh, to learn it. Uh, I would even point out the uh, tutor room and the tutors. The hours are still posted here and I know they're posted on the front of there. So the opportunity is there. Uh, I guess there's no substitute for just time on task. That's what it takes. And I know many of you have been uh, working on it. A number of you uh, came and asked me questions yesterday in, in lab, so I can tell you're working, working towards that. Um, a lot of the questions I got weren't about energy. That had me a little concerned. It was more about Newton's laws of motion, so it was still chapters five and chapter six is where I was getting questions yesterday. But... Uh, uh, hopefully the the energy ones you are are working on all right the uh, place we left off was I think it was at number 22 uh, we had that bullet yeah here it is let's read it again 22 a 100 gram bullet is fired from a rifle having a barrel of 0.6 meters long and so we had something like this. Here is the barrel. The shell is in here something. The piece of lead is jammed inside like that. The gunpowder ignites from the hammer here. And so something like that. Uh, I just read that the distance of the barrel is 0.6 meters. And so we went in a long discussion about the equation for the force, which they give us as, I remember, a 15,000. Anything else here? What does it say? Choose the origin to be the location where the bullet begins to move. 
then the force the force in newtons exerted on the expanding gas is given by 15,000 plus 10,000 x minus 25,000. So plus 10,000 x minus 25,000 x squared. And so where we finished on Monday then was this plot here that kind of showed us a parabola that is upside down. Starting with an intersection here at 15,000 and we spent a little time talking about the physics of it. Um, although really not necessary to solve the problem, um, you would have to know something about you know, molecular motion and pressure to, for that to make any sense. Uh, but you do know that, I, I trust, from the, the Physics uh, 102. It's not your first physics course here. So we talked a little bit about that and why it would go up and peak and then it would go down and why it would go, go negative. Where is 0.6 meters on here? I'm not sure. Uh, I do know that it always has a positive force and an acceleration until it gets here. So if I was trying to get this bullet to go as fast as it can, that might be a good length to my barrel. I'd get all the force I could, all the acceleration I could from my expanding gases. And at that length, whatever that length is, then the bullet's going as fast as the expanding gases. And, and anything more than that doesn't, doesn't do, me, do me any good here. So that's probably the best length of the barrel. So I don't want to make it too long. Um, on the other hand, a long barrel isn't always such a good thing. You don't you know, want to be holding this thing and it's 10 meters out there. So it's kind of hard to maneuver and, and manipulate. And uh, of course, if it's an army rifle, it could be even worse if you're in a narrow street or a hallway and attacking some insurgents. I mean, how do you turn around with a big barrel? You, you, you don't, right? So modern forces, you, you, you see the smaller one. And, they even got it mounted right here, so the barrel's like this, you know, so they can, you know, have their quick maneuver. Anyway, so I don't, shouldn't get down to that. All right. But before I get lost here, this is, an, this is a question about work, work and energy. So there's where we left off. We left off with this, this equation for force. And so here's the question. A, determine the work done by the expanding gases um, on the bullet as the bullet travels the length of the barrel. So A is not a real tough one here, but it is going back to our calculus, back to our integral. Oh, maybe I should even go one step further back because work is actually a dot product. And so it's F dot dr, which means there's two pieces to it. There's the force in the x direction dx and there's the force in the y dy. And that's how we got started in chapter 7. We, we had a discussion about the definition of work and, and how we would transfer our understanding of work from our physics 102 level up to our calculus level here and how it would become just instead of a product, uh, a, an integral, an, an infinite sum. And so there could be movement in both a horizontal and a vertical. This one problem though, it is just horizontal or just x. And so we'll just label the x-axis as the bullet. So there's no point in having a y component. And the force is then given by this equation. So this is 15,000 plus 10,000 x minus 25,000 x squared dx. And so I picked this problem because it was a non-constant force. Make you going to do an integral. Not, not a real hard one, but that is the force as it is being applied from 0 to 0.6. So there is the limit of my, my integral, my, my uh, definite uh, integral. So the first integral gives me 15,000 x evaluated from 0 to 0 0.6. The next one gives me 10,000 x squared over 2 evaluated from 0 to 0.6. And then finally the last one gives me 25,000 x cubed over 3 evaluated from 0 to 0.6. And so if we get out our calculator, this first one would be 15,000 times 0.6. Add to that 
10,000 times 0.6 squared divided by 2. Subtract from that 25,000 point six raised to a power of three all of that also divided by three and hmm oh bummer I hit the wrong key here uh, let me try that again how do I get a re-enter re-enter um, there we go twenty five thousand was it 20, wait, where did I make the mistake? 25,000 times 0. 0.6, good. 10,000 times 0. 0.6 squared divided by two. Yeah, here's my mistake. 25,000, I forgot to do times, times 0. 0.6 raised to a power of three, and then that whole term divided by three, and I get 9,000. And maybe I should ask you guys, 9,000 what? Joules, yeah, so the units are joules. Force in newtons, distance in meters, newton times a meter is a, a joule. So they're saying it's 9,000 joules. I'm going to ask a question that, that your author doesn't ask, but it's probably worth showing here is, okay, what would the speed of the bullet be? Right, that's that work energy theorem. That was this whole idea then that the network is equal to the change in kinetic energy. So you've done this much work. This is our 9,000 joules. It must equal to one half final speed squared minus one half initial speed squared. And so that's why we caring about work. Work leads directly to velocity. And so that little chart you might remember we had, maybe it's worth putting up here again, but position is connected to velocity, which is connected to acceleration. And so that was our mechanic, that was our first test, that was chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. After that, we learned that acceleration comes from Newton's second law, net force, net force, being the idea that it's a sum of a bunch of individual forces. So this is our new stuff for the test coming up, chapters 5 and 6. This is our old stuff, chapters 1 through 4. And 7 and 8 are right here that if we deal with work or energy, the idea being that knowing the energy or the work can lead to velocity. Uh, it can also lead over to forces too, so we should have some problems that deal with that, and, and we will. But this one is showing this effect that I can do the work, and uh, w doing work would then give me velocity. A uh, key reference point again here, this problem said find the work, so you knew you had to do work for this. But if they didn't say find the work, what would be the clue to solve this problem? Because when you're on a test, you're kind of going, oh, should I do this with forces and acceleration? Or should I do this with work and energy? What was the clue? Force. Force. Yeah, if you've got the force and distance, because acceleration involving time. And so had they give me a plot that involved the force as a function of time, I would be more tempted to do this approach. What's the acceleration? Integrate the acceleration and get the velocity. But given the fact that they gave me a force with distance, it tells me I want to do energy to get to, to here. Okay? And then, coming back to here, now that we've done this integral already to, to get to the work, the other side of the equation, the one-half mv squared, came from an integral that we already did. We said it was path dependent. Don't bother to do it again. So now it's just algebra at this point. Um, I would even cross out that term because the idea was it, its initial speed is zero. So it's, it's back here in the chamber getting ready to, to fire. And so my velocity is zero. So now I can put 9,000 joules equals one-half. And now I just got to plug into the mass. And they did say at the beginning the bullet is 100 grams. The only maybe careful point here is to point out that I'm not going to put a hundred grams. 
I need to convert it into kilograms. Why? Well, that really takes us all the way back to chapter one. That's why we did those unit conversions and paying attention to our units. But as you pointed out, a joule is a newton times a meter and a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So it's got the kilograms in it. So make sure you put the kilograms in there. Then you can go final speed squared. And so as you move the two over to here, I guess that becomes 18,000. When you divide by 0.1, that becomes 180,000. If we pay attention to our units, the kilograms would cancel off and you would have meters squared over seconds squared equals final speed squared. And so now we can answer what is the, the speed of this. So 180,000, one, two, three. Uh, oops, I forgot to take the square root. Okay, square root, let's try that again. And uh, 400 and 24 meters per second. And so that's the, that's the speed of it. <coughs> okay. Um, which I'm not sure, seems like a good speed. Seems like a reasonable one. Speed of sound is what, like 340, so this is Mach 1 plus, you know, about 1.3 Mach, so seems like a reasonable number. Well, there's A. Let's go on to B. B. What if the barrel is one meter long? How much work would it be? Would it be more work? Would it be less work? Now, I hear a bunch of you say more work right off the bat. Are you sure? It's more distance, but does that mean more work? Yeah, it does depend on where we are here, right? I mean, if this is point 0.6, we start doing more distance, we start doing negative work, and this slows the bullet down. So maybe it's worth pausing before we go forward and say, well, where is this? Yeah, and hopefully you can even see it here. I think the author gave us some easy numbers uh, purposely so we don't have to solve this. I mean, when does this function equal zero? Yeah, doesn't when x equal one? 15 and 10, 25, were they real nice to us here? All right, so if I put a 1 in here for x, I get a 15,000 and a 10,000, that's 25,000, and a minus 25,000 gives me 0. So they've given me an easy equation to work with. You could probably also solve it using the quadratic formula if you want, if you don't recognize that, but that will be the solution. The force comes out to be 0 after 1 meter. So this barrel is at about a point six. Well, I'll, I'll put it right there. And so the work could be represented by the area under that curve. And as we go forward from point six to one meter, yes, it still is positive work. <coughs> and you might say one meter then is really the most I don't know if you want to use the word efficient, however you want to define efficiency, but in terms of getting the maximum speed from this bullet, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at a one meter long uh, uh, barrel here. And so I would expect then, because of that, to get more work and a greater speed as I got to one meter. So I can do the same thing here for B and say, all right, let's do this integral again. And of course, I don't really think I need to write it all the way out. Wouldn't this just come out to be the same integral where it would be 15,000 x 0 to 1, uh, 10,000 x squared 0 to 1, 25,000 x cubed over 3, 0, 1. And again, being 1 is kind of nice. This is a 15,000. Uh, this would be, what, 10,000 divided by 2? So that's uh, 5,000. This, ooh, is 25,000 divided by 3. 
three. Uh, is that eight and a third? Okay. And so that's what I'm subtracting off. So I'm taking 20 and subtracting off eight and a third. So I think I'm at 11,066. Anybody else do the math? Yeah? All right. So if I put in all my numbers, that's what I get for the work. And then definitely, yep, that work is more than, than this one. And it's the most you're ever going get, to get out of this. This would be then pulling in the rest of this. There's the total amount of, of work. So 11,600. Now, again, your author doesn't ask it, but why don't I add to this problem? Since it's not about doing the problem, it's about learning to solve the problem. What now would be the speed of the bullet? Should be a little bit more, but it's still the same idea. We're putting in the work energy theorem. This is now the work. It must equal to one half m uh, final speed squared minus one half m initial speed squared. And again, like before in A, bullet is starting here from rest and uh, moving on. So if I take my 11,666, multiply by 2, divide by a tenth, that's the velocity squared, take the square root of that, and we're looking at a 483. So final speed is 483 meters per second. So got a little more speed, not too much more. Gotta wonder if it's worth it. I mean you've grown the barrel from a 0.6 to 1 meter. That's 66% increase. You know, that's two-thirds increase uh, in your barrel. And you, and you really haven't gained that much speed. And of course, you can see why you're in this part of the curve where the force is kind of low. So even though you have quite a bit of distance, the force is kind of low. You're not going to get much, much work from it. Well, let's try then yet another one here. Slightly different one here. Here I use the work energy theorem. This one, one right before it actually, number 21, might be a better approach to use conservation of energy. So that's why I picked this one. I thought, ah, oh, here's, a, here's a good example. 21 and then says, all right, what's going on here? Well, this says a 6,000 kilogram freight car rolls along the rails with negligible friction. The car is then brought to rest by a combination of two coiled springs as illustrated in figure 21. Well, for those of you who might not have the book with you today, let me draw this, this picture. And so they've got a picture, at least the best that I can, of a railroad track and uh, it's probably one of these switching houses or rail cars you know you bring them up and and you, you you know have all the different trains from different parts of the country like Union Station downtown uh, LA you know they all come in from different areas and you got to move these and then these and we want okay we want to take these cars that came down from the Pacific Northwest with lumber on them we want to put them on this train because now this train's going to go to the to Texas and wherever and so we want you know to get the lumber over there and this stuff from Texas we want to get up to Seattle and this stuff down to San Diego so you're moving the trains around here and so you got to put them down these little uh, old railways here and so you you take one of the trains here and say okay here's this big cart and you you unhook it and you, you, you push it that way and so it's kind of moving along hopefully not very fast uh, but the idea then is you're going to run out of track at some point. You want it to come to a stop so then you can later on hook it on to the, to the next train here. And so it makes a lot of sense then to say, okay, well, we don't want it to go crashing out the end, so they give it a spring. And so they've got this long spring sitting here. Now, with that said, a nice engineering technique is sometimes... It makes more sense to have a double spring. And that's what they're showing here. They're saying the inner one has a spring constant of K1 and an outer one of K2. Well, why? It's also common in, in, a, in a mattress. If you've ever taken a mattress apart here, you'll kind of see this double spring. 
It, it, right, and an uh, automobile, same thing. Because look what you have here. What you have at first is you have the ability to adjust to small forces. But if the force is pretty big, it's going to compress this spring on down, and then what happens? Then the second one kicks in. And so the second one can handle the, 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 the larger amount of, of force there. And so you can have parts on your spring that can carry the, the lighter stuff, like your feet, and it will still feel kind of soft. But then you put some heavier stuff, like your waist there, then it will sink down and that secondary spring will kick in. Or if this is a work truck, you, you might have it loaded. Or before it's loaded, you might have it compress here. And then, here later on, as you get to, okay, where should the springs be touching when this thing's loaded? So that's what they have here. So again, a 6,000 kilogram freight car rolling along the rails with negligible friction. The car is brought to rest by a combination of two coiled springs as illustrated in figure 21. Both springs can be defined by or described by Hooke's law with K1 equaling 1600 newtons per meter and then K2 at 3400. Newtons per meter. Okay, so again, you see the larger spring constant. You see how the second one kind of adds to the force. So as the first one compresses a certain distance, then the second one starts adding to that. Okay, now again, here's where we get back to that first step. Do you got a good physical picture of what's going on here? Because there are some subtleties that hopefully you will see here, and if you miss it, in the physical picture, you won't do it right in the mathematics. And so we've got to have that good physical picture. Well, let me keep reading on here. It says, after the spring compresses a distance of 30 centimeters, the second spring then acts together with the first one for an additional force. So what they're saying in this is that this first one sticks out 30 centimeters more and so we've got to compress that first one 30 be before the second one even starts to act and then and then it does act and then did you catch in that physical picture both of them then are starting to be compressed it's not just one it's, it becomes both at that moment and so it's important to see that physical picture because that physical picture hopefully helps us with putting in the equation. All right, well, finally we get to the question. Um, it says the car comes to rest 50 centimeters after first contact with this two spring system. Find the car's initial speed. Okay. Alright, so the car is coming in with some unknown speed. V equals question mark. It's moving along and it compresses this. And it says it moves 50 centimeters before coming to a stop. Um, I think they gave the mass somewhere at the beginning. Yeah, there it was, 6,000. So I didn't put that up here. But here's 6,000 kilograms. Alright, so... Did I do my step one? You got a good physical picture here of what's going on. You got the mass of it. It's moving in. We don't know its speed. It's going to compress this two spring system. It's going to move 50 centimeters. Find the speed. Now hopefully one of the first things going on in your mind. Now since it is in this chapter, I'm sure you're thinking, hey, shouldn't we do this with energy? But if this was a test, it wouldn't be so easy. So should we get the speed by energy or should we get the speed by accelerations? Yeah, energy. Why? Because we know distance, right? And so it's connected back to, to distance. All right, so I probably should do it there. And I'll always throw that disclaimer, probably, because okay, I suppose there's some exceptions where even though we know distance, it uh, you know, might be better to use accelerations. 
but uh, usually not. It certainly wouldn't be my first try. My first try would be to say, I'm looking for speed. I'm given information related to distance. I'm going to try this with work and, and energy. And so I'm going to use conservation of energy. If you remember on Monday we had this. If I wrote down the initial kinetic and the initial potential, it's got to equal to the final kinetic, the final potential, and any heat that is created along the, the way. All right? And so that was our statement with conservation of energy. So let's start filling it in. Remembering that we dealt with two types of potential energy. One is gravitational potential energy. The other is a spring potential energy. Now that's kind of the general picture, but really do we need to deal with gravitational potential energy here? Is there any increase or decrease in height? There's not, right? So really It'd be okay if I just don't even deal with that in this problem. We'll deal with the next problem. But I would just kind of say, why don't we just say, look, the energy in terms of potential doesn't really matter. Uh, you could say either the height of the boxcar is zero, and so initial potential would be zero, and final potential energy would be zero. No, or you could just say the height is, you know, one or two meters above the ground or this could be up on a platform and it could be seven meters up but the fact that it doesn't change its height tells me that the gravitational potential energy term is going to show up on both sides and it's going to be the same value whether that value be zero or whether it be 20 or 30 it just doesn't come into play here so to keep the problem a little simpler here when I say potential energy for this problem I'm going to just put a little s for the spring, a little s, because it's for the, the spring. There is no gravitational potential energy. But I want to make sure that's clear, because some problems do go higher or lower, and gravitational potential energy is an important piece of it. So I don't want to forget about it. I just want to point out it's not relevant for this problem. But again, isn't that the, the beauty of doing the physics? Isn't it about, oh, got me started again. What's physics about? Physics is about knowing how to apply a few powerful fundamental concepts to explain a universe of phenomenon. So, yeah, this one doesn't need it, but the next one might. In fact, do you want all of the answers again for chapters 7 and 8? There it is. There's all the answers for 7 and 8 and half of the answers for the test next Wednesday. Right there. You want the other half of the answers for the test? I'll, I'll put it over here. Make sure you write it down. Sum of the forces equal MA. Alright, so there's half the answers. There's the other half. Guarantee it. You're all going to get 100%, right? Alright, well you get the idea that the principles are pretty simple but putting them together making sure you understand the physical picture behind them putting that into the equation and solving the equations are the, all that deductive reasoning is where these get hard and where these can get long and, and, and challenging so let's do that let's take this fundamental idea and apply it to this scenario all right, so for this case, I would say, what's the initial kinetic energy? Yeah, I guess it would be one half times 6,000 times V squared, right? So there would be the initial kinetic energy. I know it's mass, but I don't know its speed. Look at the next term. The next term is the potential energy for the spring. Any potential energy in this spring? Well, let's see. We calculate it with one half k x squared. So if x is zero, the, I guess the answer is no. So is x zero? What does x equaling zero mean again? Right, and so you might remember, and I think it was over here on this side of the board, 
on yesterday, I or went Monday, wanted to emphasize, and this is why you'll always find us in our physics class working out these equations. We need you to understand where they came from. You don't want to be using them in the wrong time, at the wrong place. You want to know what their foundation is. It's, it's what I said on, on, on Monday. If you go to build a second story, you need to pay attention to what the first story was built. The foundations are crucial. And so you got to know where those come from. If you don't, you're going to set yourself up for disaster. And so people who just give the formulas and say, oh, I'm just going to plug and chug, get usually about half of it right and half of it wrong. And that's why they get an OK grade. And that's why their first prototype is OK, only to say that, well, we got a lot of failures here. We need to build another prototype. Because there's a meaning behind all this. And this is a good example of that. So what we did is we did Hooke's Law. We integrated Hooke's Law. So we said the integral of f dx. And we got this 1 half kx squared. So this equation is valid as long as Hooke's Law is, is valid. When is Hooke's Law's equation valid? Well, zero force corresponds with zero distance. So in other words, Hooke's Law, the definition of x equal to zero is when you have the spring either unstretched or uncompressed. And that's what we have here. So, where does x equal to zero on this one? Well, it's here for this spring and it's here for that spring. Don't miss that. It's two different spots for two different springs. And so when I put them in, of course, x equaling to zero, as many of you already said, well, it's not compressed or it's not stretched. The energy has to be zero. Yeah, I would agree with that statement. But more than that, you also see that x equals to zero is different for the different springs. Absolutely important. And you got to see that from both the physical picture and where did the equation come from. Because as we go to the other side of the equation and we say, well, what's the final kinetic energy? Well, they say it pushes in, pushes, 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 pushes in until it travels 50 centimeters. And at that point, it comes to a stop. Now, coming to a stop means they're telling me the velocity is zero. So what's the kinetic energy? Zero. All right, so there's the next step for this problem. Then I can come over here and say, what is the potential energy in the spring? Springs, plural. And so I would have a one-half and a one-half. I would have a 1,600 and I would have a 3,400. And so I'll pause right there. You see how I'll have two equations? Don't I have two springs being compressed? Yeah. So I've got two springs compressed. I need to calculate the energy going into each of the, of the springs. What is it? All right, well, then I can come to this first one. How much was this first one compressed? Now, that's probably the easier of the two. It's, it's clearly just 50 centimeters. Now, notice I will put 0.5 and square it. Uh, because again, I am doing things in kilograms here and newtons per meter here. And so I've got kilograms and meters as my unit. So make sure you put your distance in, in meters, even though they told it to you in, in, in centimeters. And then hopefully by me giving you all those clues, you see this one. What's the X there? 0.2, right? It's only 20 centimeters. And we got to convert it to meters, okay? So don't use the same x. The x's are not measured from the same location. That was the argument I made back here. You need to remember what our definition of x equal to zero is. It comes from Hooke's Law. It shows up again in this, in this formula. And if you miss that, you might want to put the same value of x in each of those two equations. And in that case, you'll get it wrong every single time. It's, again, one of many reasons why this makes a good problem. Well, now it's just algebra here and to say, okay, what is the final speed? So if we get our calculator out, we can do this one, which is one-half times 1,600 
times 0.5 squared plus 1 half times 3400 times 0.2 squared and I'll just hit equals. Um, bringing this to the other side is a 2, dividing it by the 6,000, taking the square root of all of that. Ooh, that's pretty small. Did I, well, I guess I don't want it going real fast, but I'm wondering if I hit another wrong key again. Anybody else do this? Yeah, it's pretty small. Yeah, 0.3 what you got? Okay. One half, da, 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 one half, da, 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 da. yeah, okay, so it doesn't look like I hit a wrong key. All right, good. So there's the, there's the speed. And then, of course, that's the gist of the problem and the, and the point of the, of the problem here. 21 here. Well, why don't we move on? This one, as you notice, did not have any gravitational potential energy. I think the next two do. In fact, the next one I think only has potential energy. The one after that has potential, gravitational potential and a spring potential energy. If I remember selecting these. I'll go to 38. So number 38 says this. And I'll just read it here if you don't have the book in front of you again. It says a 400 Newton child is in a swing that is attached to ropes that are two meters long. Find the gravitational potential energy of the child earth system relative to the child's lowest position when A, the rope is horizontal, B, the rope makes a 30 degree angle with the vertical, and C, when the child is at the bottom of the circular arc. All right, well, again, let's draw a picture. Got a good physical picture. I guess the, the ground might look here. Uh, the swing set might be built something like this. The rope would come down. Here would be the swing. Uh, they are telling us that this distance here is two meters long. From that information, I think we can deduce that the swing is going to make this arc. It's going to be a uh, circle or at least a fraction of a circle. If it goes all the way horizontal on both directions, I guess it's a semi-circle if you be more particular. My son didn't appreciate me dropping him at high school this morning. We, I go, which parking lot you in? He had practice early. I go, which parking lot you want? He goes, oh, do the circle one. Well, they've got this neat drop-off one, you know, it goes like this. Uh, but I had to tell them it wasn't a circle, it was a semi-circle. Yeah. He goes, well, nobody calls it a semi-circle. So I told him, well, he should, you know, this is a school of higher education, you should fix this term. Uh, he just rolled his eyes and left. Okay, so it is a semicircle. <laughs> I guess a circle is all the way around. And so what they have here is this swing going back and forth. And they give us some different positions. They say, well, what is it when it's completely out horizontal like this? Uh, what is it when it's off at an angle? And what did I read there? 30 degrees? 30 degrees? Let me come back here. Uh, 38. A 400 kilogram child, da, 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 da. yeah, A, when the rope is horizontal, B, when it makes 30 degrees, and C, when it is at the bottom of the arc. So at three different positions, they want us to calculate the gravitational potential energy. All right, well, I'll pause right there, like I do with all these. Got a good physical picture of what's going on? Okay, that physical picture is important. I think you really saw it here, how important it was to know what value of X you're, you're going to put here. So there's my physical picture. That's why I like to, to draw it. And if it helps, draw it big. You know, big pictures solve big problems. Little pictures solve little problems. Well, okay, maybe that's not completely true. But, but, but again, the more detail you, you stop, you think about what's going on, the less problems you will have as you, you, you go to uh, apply the math uh, to it. Now, this is asking about potential 
energy. All right, gravitational potential energy. So let me put that here on the board. What was our equation that we derived for gravitational potential energy? Well, then at the MGY, I guess I already put it up here. Okay, and so there's my MGY. And so I picked this problem as a, an illustration of, okay, that's the formula. But I really like it because here's what the author says. The author says, and, 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 and to explain to me why he, he even writes this. He says, find the gravitational potential energy of the child Earth system relative to the child's lowest point. Well, now what does that mean? Relative to the child's lowest point. Okay, I agree the child doesn't go all the way to the ground. Okay, I would say the child has size and there's a center of mass issue. But, but hold on to that because none of our objects have had size yet. That starts next chapter, by the way. And so we'll make our world a little harder. So we've only been doing the easy stuff. And I'm sure you've been saying that all along as you've done the homework. But, but our objects don't have any size yet. And so that's about to change. But after the test. All right, so good comment, but I'm not even going down that road. Why, why does he even just make that statement? Okay, right. This is an issue of where does y equal zero? Maybe I'll ask it again over here. In the problem we just did, where does x equal to zero for the spring? Yeah, it's where the spring was either unstretched or uncompressed. It's what we call its natural length. That's where x equals to zero. So to use this equation, which leads to this equation. So if you're going to use this equation, you're really using this equation. This equation is only valid where the definition of x equals to zero is the natural length of the spring. What about here? Has y equal to zero been defined? in any of our equations that came up with it? See, no, it hasn't. If you remember where this one came from, it came from the fact that the force of gravity was minus mg in the vertical direction. So we went to calculate the energy, we integrated the force and the distance it moved. And what we came up with is mgy. But in this equation, what we are really saying here is I'm not defining where y equals to zero. I am defining down as negative and up as positive. So using this equation, we really haven't defined y equals to zero. You might say it shows up when we do an indefinite integral as a constant of integration. And so the point is we this one, you might say, is a definite integral. This is an indefinite integral. We have not defined yet where y equals to zero. In other words, we're back to that. You have freedom of choice, but once chosen, it has power over you. So be careful on what you pick. If you pick this equation, you are also picking where x equals to zero. If you pick this equation, you are picking up as positive and down to negative, but you still haven't picked where y equals to zero. And this is why I wanted to grab this problem. Why don't we do this? This is the whole point the author is trying to make relative to the lowest point. Let's call that y equals to zero. I think there's a natural tendency to call the ground y equals to zero. But if you do that, you never really know what the height of the child is. Do they say anything about how high the child is above the ground? We don't know that number. And so to pick the ground would not be very useful here at all. And so all we can kind of do is get a relative change in height. So keep that in mind. It becomes a powerful tool, tool for you that you can still pick y equals to zero because picking y equal to zero at an appropriate place may make the potential energy to come out to be zero. And isn't it nice when you have a big equation if one of them is zero? Yeah. And so there it is. Oh, and I just realized back here, I guess I never said anything about heat. 
<laughs> but uh, nobody asked. So I, you good with that? No friction, no heat was created for that one? Yeah. And so we haven't, we haven't done any problems with, with that. Well, now I can actually answer the problems, and, but the point of picking it was really to get into this discussion. That this is the equation for gravitational potential energy. Y equals to zero is still within your freedom to pick. So pick it where you want. Uh, in this case, the author is telling you where to pick it. And so the author is saying, pick it at the lowest point. So I'm going to put a dotted line, I'm going to put Y equals to zero, and now I'm going to answer A. What is the gravitational potential energy of the child when the rope is horizontal? Well, it would be an MGY. What's Y? Yeah, it's going to be two meters, right? They said the rope is two meters long. And so when you swing up like here, you are at a height of two meters. Oh, I heard somebody else say R. Yeah, the radius of that circle, the two meters. How about the MG? Do I know the MG? Well, I know it collectively. I don't know mass individually. They didn't give me the mass of the child, but they did say 400 Newton child. What are they saying? Yeah, the weight of the child is 400. And so this is 400. So then it's simple math. 400 times 2 is 800 and 800 joules. So there's the, the energy. 400 times 2, 800 joules. Newton times a, a meter. So the actual problem itself, I, I don't think is a hard one. Um, and again, you'll probably see that through all of these in, in 7 and 8. It, once you, once you kind of write out the equation, it's usually a bunch of algebra and you can just put in like we had here. Put in the uh, formulas, the integrals that we've already done and then you can come up with the answer after some, some algebra. B says, what is the potential energy when the child is at a 30 degree angle from the vertical? Alright, well, I think you already know the mg is 400, so I'll put that first. What's y? Would it be 2 meters? Would it be 2 sine 30? Would it be 2 cosine 30? And a lot of you are falling for that 2 cosine 30. It's not easy to do. But take a close look here. Maybe I'll draw a vertical line. There's the 2 meters. There's the child now at 30 degrees. If you draw across, this is 2 cosine 30. But isn't this what we want, the height y right there? Yeah, and so as many of you saw, this would be 2 meters minus 2 meters cosine 30. That's the height. Okay. And then, how, of course, how do we get that? Physical picture. You got to go back and look at that picture. What's going on? What did we mean by why? Why we meant height. How high up from what? How high up from zero? Where did we call zero? We called zero here. So we are looking for this height, not this part of it. And again, I don't know how else to explain that other than do you see it in the picture? It, it comes from the, the physical picture there. Of course, now I can put some numbers into my calculator, so I, I will. Let me just check my mode of my calculator. Am I still in degrees? Okay, I am. Good. And so if I go uh, 2 minus 2 times cosine of 30, I get a height of about 0.268. All right. Now I can multiply that by my 400 and coming up with a 107. So 107 joules is the, is the idea. By the way, another reason I picked this problem, do you see that height? The common error some of you fell into, you take 2 and you multiply cosine of 30. You're going to need this for the lab we do on Monday, so don't forget it. I mean, we're doing an energy lab and one of them is, hey, calculate the potential energy of this system and it has to be a little pendulum that's swinging back and forth. And so we actually have, uh, it's a two-part experiment, but part two has a pendulum and uh, you know, 
one of the things says make a plot of the potential energy. And what you have for data is the angle as it swings back and forth. Okay? And so you want to catch that whole I idea. All right, well, finally, and probably the easiest one of all, but certainly the most conceptually important one because it comes to our definition of y equals to zero is the last one. Well, what is the potential energy at C? That is at its lowest point. Answer? Zero. Because it is at this point where we have defined y equals to zero. And we can pick it anywhere we want. It hasn't been chosen by using that equation. So we can, we can pick it. And don't pick it twice, by the way. Don't say, ah, oh, I picked it here, um, and for one object, well, I guess you could do it for different objects. That might work. But what I was getting at is, you know, don't, don't change in the middle. Unlikely you would do that. But it is important we pick it. Ah, well, let's try my last one here from uh, Chapter 7. And then if I want to see some with some frictions, and some from uh, Chapter 8 here. And so, number, number is this, 57 is one that has kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, spring potential energy. Again, let me read it for those of you who may not have the book here. It says, a ball launched in a pinball machine has a spring that has a spring constant of 1.2 newtons per centimeter. Well, there's more to it, but I'm going to pause right there, realizing it says a ball launcher and a pinball machine. And maybe with today's video game, do you guys know what a pinball machine is? Yeah, you do. Okay, good. Fortunately, it's a classic machine that's been around and just can't be replaced type thing here. Uh, but if I was drawing a picture, and the picture they have looks something like this. This is the ball. The pinball machine is sloped up. And you launch it with a plunger here. The handle comes back out of the machine here. And so you got this, whatever a handle looks like. Uh, something like that here. OK. And it's got this spring in it, like that. So as you grab the handle and pull it back and let it go, the spring's going to push the ball on up. And you could, you could pull it all the way back, or you could pull it halfway back, or whatever distance you want in order to give this ball some push to go up and come out and play the game and then you know how the game is played then you hit it with the with the flippers okay and so there's this this idea so that's what 57 is and uh, I'll keep reading so it says a ball launcher in a pinball machine has a spring that has a force constant of 1.2 newtons per centimeter. Now I'll even put that here. They're saying the spring constant is 1.2 newtons per centimeter. Oh, let me pause right there. Because they gave you this one just to draw your attention all the way back to your units and all the way back to chapter one. Wait, if we're going to do units and energy in joules, what do we need? We need meters, right? We need newtons, we need meters. So maybe before I go too far, I better do my unit conversion here. So here's my 1.2 newtons. Remember that CM does not stand for centimeter. It's C for centa and M for meter. So let me put in centa and then let me put in meters. And so that's the easiest way, I think, of converting my centa meters into my meters. I already got the M for meters, just replace the centa with its variable. And so this becomes then divided by a hundredth, which then becomes a hundred and twenty newtons per meter. So again, catch that right away. You missed that. You might put it in wrong into your equations. And even if you set up your equations wrong, but you put in your spring constant incorrectly, you, you're going to run into troubles here. So it's 120 newtons 
uh, per meter. All right, well, I better keep reading here. The surface on which the ball moves is inclined at an angle of 10 degrees with respect to the horizontal. Okay, so this is the part I was saying that the machi machine has a slope to it, so you got to put the ball up and then it rolls down, and of course then you use the flippers to shoot it back up to the, to the top. Man, it makes me want to go play a pinball game. I haven't played a pinball game in ages. I, I need to go to a pizza parlor this weekend. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. But anyways, the, uh, the, the, there's the, uh, the surface. Uh, the spring is initially compressed then five centimeters. Okay, so what they're saying here is you're going to pull on this handle down five centimeters. And there they go again, giving me centimeters. All right, so I'm going to change that to meters, 0.05 meters. I, I think that is probably going to be important here, otherwise I'll foul up my units. I need to keep them consistent here. It says, find the launching speed of this 100 gram ball when the plunger is released. Friction and the mass of the plunger can be ignored. Alright, so the plunger they're saying doesn't, doesn't weigh much. They are saying the ball though is 100 grams. Now again, first thing that goes off in my mind is, no, 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 wait, 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 back to my unit conversion. And so, so a lot of things in this problem, they've thrown the old chapter one at you. Make sure you get your units correct and pay attention to your units. All right, so this is 0.1 kilograms here. Uh, the part about the plunger, they're saying, uh, don't worry about it. So in other words, we, as it goes up, we don't have to say the plunger has you know, any kinetic energy. It, it doesn't have much, much mass. And they've even helped me out by saying there's no friction here, um, which probably isn't true, but it would be a harder problem, not just because there's friction, but also the friction would make the ball start to roll and we haven't done anything with rolling yet. We gotta do as we talked about earlier, we gotta give our object size. Once we give it size, we now realize it can roll. So chapter nine, we give it size. Chapter 10, we let it roll. Chapter 11, we let it roll and translate. And so that's kind of what is coming up for the next series of, of, of chapters. But again, don't worry about that tell after the test, okay? That's what you're going to be doing the weekend after next. And, uh, and uh, so more on that to, to come here. All right, but I better pause. A little longer problem, but again, what I like to do first is got a good physical picture of what's going on? Because again, that physical picture tells us what we should be going on. Now again, since this is in chapter 7, I'm sure they want me to do work and energy. That's probably obvious. But if this was a test problem, would I do it by forces or would I do it by work and energy? Work and energy. Why? Because I've got distance here. I've got a spring, which is a variable force, which is not fun to integrate at all. Then, I've also got the fact that the... the uh, the forces in, in distance, okay? And so that would be my clue here. So if I saw this one on the test, I would be doing it in terms of chapters seven and eight energy, as opposed to one that involving time, I would probably doing it in terms of accelerations here, okay? And maybe I should also point out another and hopefully this one's clear because you couldn't do it with work and energy, but if the problem said find the acceleration, isn't that clearly a problem from chapters five and six? It is find the acceleration. You do that by the free body diagram and all the forces and Newton's second law. So I wouldn't even try to find the acceleration using work and energy. This gives me speed, but it doesn't give me accelerations, right? And so or the other way around, what if it's asking me to find a force? Again, like the tension in the string. Some of you guys were working on that one yesterday. Two blocks moving, a string tied between them. What's the tension on it? 
And again, that's a clearly one involving free body diagrams and, and forces. But I gotta admit, one of, one of the tough things to do is decide, you know, what basic physical principle are you gonna use? So far, those decisions aren't real hard. Up until now, it was always forces. Now we have energy. But next chapter, it's gonna get momentum. The one after that is gonna get angular momentum. The next after that is gonna get universal law of gravitation. The next one after that is gonna be fluid dynamics. By the time you guys hit the final exam, you need to look at that problem and say, ooh, do I solve this with Newton's laws? Conservation of energy? Conservation of momentum? Conservation of angular momentum? Fluid dynamics? I mean, which do I make a pick from? And then as we get into the next chapter, it just keeps growing. And so by the time you get a real problem, you're like, what basic principle do I even begin with? Yeah? Um, to find the acceleration, would you need a free body diagram? Or could you just do uh, F equals KX and then go equals MA and you divide by mass? You wouldn't I would do a free body diagram because you... Because it's frictionless and stuff, so I mean, you're just giving a spring force that's pushing you in one direction. And? You're missing one. Oh, the gravity. Gravitation. All right, so I've got... I've got the spring and I've got gravity, yet no friction, that's true. No, you're right. the gravity. But I'd go back to the free body diagram, make sure I don't miss any forces, and then I would get the acceleration. Yeah. Okay, so, like I said, this one, hopefully you got that good physical picture. Clearly, because it's in this chapter, it must be one on, uh, on energy. So let, let me put that up here. Let me put initial kinetic plus initial potential must equal to final kinetic plus final potential plus any heat that's created along the, along the way, any, any friction. Uh, but as I pointed out, and uh, should have on the last problem, but as I pointed out in yesterday's lecture, really we don't have our friction, we don't have our heat, we don't have our non-conservative forces until chapter 8. So, even though we kind of merged our concept together, we haven't really had any with heat yet. That's, that's to come here. So we get into chapter 8, we'll see a term there. But as I said, no, no, no friction. So I'm, I'll cross that one out in the beginning. But where it does begin to have an effect, and the reason I picked this problem, is I would say there's an initial gravitational potential energy and an initial spring potential energy. So we've got both going on. Would you agree? I mean, doesn't the spring change its length and therefore its energy? And doesn't the height change as it moves along this incline? And so it's why it makes a good problem. It's one that involves all three of our fundamental energies here. Our spring potential energy, our gravitational potential energy, and our kinetic. It's only missing some heat. But again, we're not ready quite for that one. That's, that's coming up uh, in, well, after this problem. We'll go over to chapter eight. So we'll do the rest of the hour from, from chapter eight, okay? Now, let me come back to the problem because they do ask for the speed. What I can't remember is they ask for the speed where? Um, the ball, the spring is initially compressed five centimeters. Okay, I got that. Find the, oh, the launching speed of the ball. Well, so they're going to make me kind of define. What do you mean by launching speed here? Yeah, I think they would. They think they mean here, right? When the when the spring gets back to its original, uh, what we call its natural length, uncompressed, unstretched, and so when it gets back to here. So they don't want to know the speed up at the top of the pinball machine or somewhere else, but but right here when it gets launched. And uh, so let's give it a try. All right, so let's go through this. And again, this physical picture, if you imagine yourself playing the game, you kind of pull it back. Maybe you pause. We'll give it a go. Don't you mean What's this? Final. Oh, thank you. Yes, I do mean final. Final gravitational potential energy. Final spring. Yeah. So final's on this side, initial's on this side. Okay, so back to this. That one's probably the easiest part of this problem is, okay, what's the initial kinetic energy? Well, zero. It's not moving. Velocity, zero. Okay. Let's get into this one. What is the initial gravitational potential energy? It's back to here. Where is y equal to zero? Make a choice. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and use this equation, mgy. But, but remember, my choice of y equal to zero has not yet been chosen. 
So, where would you like to pick it? Do you want to pick it where the ball gets launched here? Uh, do you want to pick it back here where the, you know, the ball drops back to here? Both of those have something nice about them. If you pick it back here, then what does the initial potential energy become? Zero. If you pick it here, then what does the final potential energy become? Zero. So I would encourage you to pick one or the others of these. If you pick it further back, then you don't have an advantage of one of these being zero. And that, that, that's not fun. That's just adding more terms that are not necessary. So I would definitely say pick one of the places, either the initial or the final, at zero. I'll even go one step further. I would say, why don't we pick the lowest spot? To be zero. And that way I don't have to worry with negative numbers. Not, not that negative numbers are, are, are a problem, but I do need to remember, has the direction of positive and negative been chosen for me? Yeah. As soon as I use this equation, I need to remember where it came from. And where it came from is what direction is positive and negative. So if you wanted to pick the final position right here, as zero. You are more than welcome to and you will get the answer right so long as you also remember that as it goes down it would now have a negative height and therefore a negative potential energy. Okay? And so the potential energy starts off as negative and goes up to zero. Personally, I like it starting at zero and going up to positive. But the reality of the situation is we can only get the difference in potential energy. And so wherever you pick y equal to zero, it, this one will have a gain. It will go from a lower value to a higher value. Maybe negative up to zero or maybe zero up to positive, but either way you're going to have a, a, a gain here. Alright, so will it be okay if I take the initial spot when the spring is compressed as zero? And so maybe I will put the ball back here, draw a blue line over here, and call that y equal to zero. So I'd encourage you to, on your graph somewhere, on your picture I should say, somewhere, put y equal to zero, pick your choice. Remember, you still have that choice. What has been chosen for you by doing this equation is the up is positive, down is negative. But y equals to zero hasn't been. So pick it where you want and take advantage of situations that will give you zero terms. I just like the lowest spot. That's what I usually look for. What's the lowest spot? Pay no attention to the ground. I think there's a human tendency for beginning students to pick the ground as y equals to zero. If the ball goes on the ground or that low, great, it's useful. But if the ball never goes to ground, just like that swing, well, why? Why even pay attention to the ground? It's the difference that, that matters. So find the lowest spot, pick that equal to zero, and then usually things work out a, a, a little bit better. Maybe not always, but usually they, they do. So with that said, then I would put a zero there for the initial gravitational potential energy. That's, that's why I like it as a wise choice. It, it, it really helps there. Well, then you can see something that you probably realized right away. The only energy here is from the spring. Yeah. And that's what's going to give the ball some speed. It's the spring. Exactly. So how do I calculate the energy in the spring, well, it's one half times k, good. And the k we already did, 120 newtons per meter, times x squared. What's x? Is it zero? If I use this equation, which I'm about to use this one, which comes from this one, which defines zero for me. Sorry, you don't have that choice anymore. I chose it here. Freedom of choice, one chosen has power over me. There it is. I chose it right back here. I got to go back to where this came from. And so if I'm going to use this formula, one half kx squared, I need to remember where x equals to zero. So where does x equal to zero in Hooke's Law? The natural length of the spring, the unstretched or uncompressed. So, 
I'm not even going to ask you where you want to pick it. You don't have that choice. It's gone. You are, you, uh, once you did one half a kx squared, you lost it. So there is where x equals to zero. Now I hope this doesn't confuse you because it does become useful to think about the vertical y having a different origin than the x, right? So here's where x equals to zero, but here's where y equals to zero. And that's why I picked that problem. I, I wanted to emphasize those two things here. One of them is that whole idea of freedom of choice. If you just have a bunch of equations and you plug and chug, you get it right some of the time, but not the other time because you really don't remember or pay attention to where it, it, it came from. What are the consequences of using that equation? You have to know where they came from, otherwise you run into troubles. And also, we begin to see here something that, that, uh, that is a little bothersome from beginning students sometimes is, we have different reference points of the zeros. We do. We have a reference point of y equals to zero at one place, and we have another reference point of where x equals to zero at a, at a different place. One involving the energy of the spring, and the other one involving the energy of gravitational potential energy. So that's why I really like this problem. It had both energies in there. Their reference po places were different, and th that's okay. One you can pick, y equal to zero you can pick, the x equal to zero you can't pick. It's been chosen for you here, okay? So that means when I come over here and I go to put in the value of x, I, I, I can't put zero here. Probably a good thing because if I put zero it would start off with zero energy. What do I put in for x? Yeah, point oh five and I'll square it. Now, I heard somebody say negative. Okay, fair enough. If you want to say it's being compressed, it's a, it's a negative. Uh, fine. But, but whether stretched or compressed, it's the same energy. So a negative 0.05 and a positive 0.05 squared give you the, the same energy. And before I do the other side of the equation, I'm just kind of curious then to know how much energy is this to start with. You can kind of see then all of the energy is in the, the spring here. So one half times 120 times 0.05 squared equals 0.15 joules of energy. Okay, so there is my total energy uh, that I have as I pull it back. Of course, then the idea of the problem is you let it go and what's end up happening is the spring is stretching out, losing energy, giving it to the ball. And then the ball is going faster, so it's gaining kinetic energy, but it's also going higher, so it's gaining potential energy. So what happens is this energy goes into here and here and nothing left here. So as I do the right hand side of the equation, I would write this as one half m v squared. Right? And so there is my um, kinetic energy, at least the formula for my kinetic energy. And then the next one is the gravitational potential energy, which would be m g y. What's, what's, what's the value of y here? And again, this is why that physical picture is so important. Is it, is it 0.05? No, it's not 0.05, right? The spring went out 0.05, but the ball only went up that much. And I heard somebody doing the trigonometry here. That, well, that would be the sine of that angle. So, yeah, that's its height. Its height is 0 0.05 sine of 30 degrees. 30 or 10? Oh, uh, 10. It is 10. Where did I get 30? Uh, oh, the last problem had a 30 there. Yeah. Uh, I thought I heard a 30. Someone throw me off? <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, so there's the, uh, the idea. Now we can put in some numbers here, and I'm just kind of curious myself, in, instead of putting it in one big shot, what this one is, because this is the gain in potential energy just due to height, and what's left over is in kinetic energy. So 0.1 times 9.8 times 0.05 times sine of 10. 
degrees. And so this is 0 0.0085 joules. So it looks like to me not much energy goes into gravitational potential. Uh, thinking of this as 150, it looks like I only have 8 going into gravitational potential energy. So not much. Most of it really is in here in uh, kinetic energy. But let me give this a try then. This is 0.15 minus the last answer I got. Answer. Inner. Okay. Then times 2 divided by 0.1 square root of all of that. And it looks like we are talking about a speed of 1.68 meters per second if I follow my units through there and come up with the, the speed. And so there's the, the launching speed of this, of this ball. And uh, if they gave me more information, it might be kind of fun to say, well, you know, how far would it then go up? In fact, why don't I just answer that? I'll just add to this. With that speed right here, and with this incline, and with no friction, how far could it travel? Will it go only, say, 10 centimeters and come back down? We'll go 20, we'll go 30, we'll go high enough to go out the little chute and begin to play the game. Well, let's just say it, it's got a straight incline. And let's just say this incline goes for a billion miles. So, okay, it's going to stop somewhere. Okay, I know a real pinball game doesn't do that. It eventually curves over and has a speed and hits a bumper and bounces around if you, if you pull it too hard. But how high would this thing, I'm sorry, how far would this thing go here? So let's call this distance D here. And so we'll add to this problem. But again, you hopefully see, will see this, this same idea in terms of, of energy. And so now the ball has some um, speed. And so I guess I'll call this part B. But if I say initial kinetic, and initial potential is going to equal to final kinetic plus final potential plus Q. Uh, what I will have then is back here, I will have a 1 half times 0.1 times the speed of 1.68 meters per second squared. That is then, based on this speed, the kinetic energy it has now. Which then begs this question, what is the potential energy? Well, hopefully you will allow me to put just a little sub G and no S's this time because now the spring's already done doing its thing. It already gave all its energy. The spring's not going to stretch or compress any. Uh, some of you may argue, wouldn't a real spring continue on out and stretch? Yes, it would. Uh, I would argue it only does because it has mass or inertia. And they say treat the spring as if it has no mass. So it can go out and stop instantly. Obviously, a real spring wouldn't do that. So a, a real spring would be more complicated than this. But just to keep it simple, and I'm, like I said, I'm sure you're thinking that every time you sit down for the homework. Oh, these are the... I'm glad they're the simple ones here. But you, you, we got to start somewhere here and, and build up to the more realistic uh, scenarios. So that's what I'm going to say here. I'm just going to put a little G here. And then I'm also going to put a zero. Why? Yeah, where do you want to define Y equals to zero? And so I'm going to change my uh, reference point for the second half of this. I'll color it in green here and say, let's, let's just put the lowest point of the ball at y equals to zero. So there's the lowest point where it starts and now it just keeps going up that, that incline. And so there's my energy. And obviously this energy would be the same as the, that minus this. And then it goes up and up and up. And again, let's just say this is a long ramp. Eventually it's going to come to a stop up there, right? And that's kind of the key to the problem. What's going to be the kinetic energy at its final spot? Zero. And then I would have an mg 
In fact, let me put in the number mg. So m is 0.1, g is 9.8, and then let me put in y. What's y? Well, let's just draw a picture here and say it goes up to here. Wouldn't this be y? Wouldn't that be d sine 10 degrees? So this should be d sine of 10 degrees. So with a little bit of math, we could figure out how far this would go up a, a, an incline. Again, not to say that the pinball machine is, is that long, but if it was real long, well, what would I get? So this side of the equation, I'll go 1 half times 0 0.1 times 1.68 squared, and I'll just hit enter. So this is the energy it, it has. In fact, it does match that minus that. Okay, doesn't surprise me. That's where it came from. Okay, so that's the energy. Then I can divide it by 0.1, take that answer, divide it by 9.8, take that answer and divide it by the sine of 10 degrees. And it looks like we're looking at a 0.83 meters. So with that speed, it will go up about 83 centimeters. Um, well, that about a meter 83, so probably about that far. Kind of questionable if that's enough. Again. Makes me want to go to a pizza parlor this week, and I'm going to bring a meter stick, too, with me. <laughs> and see, okay, what is the, how long is it here from the ball launcher up there to the, to the top? Okay, so there's your, your distance. Well, as I said, we've done a bunch from uh, Chapter 7. Um, I threw in the information from 8, thinking it kind of made sense to kind of hook that together, because I thought it would give us all just a lot of time to help digest that material and do examples. So I knew if I gave it to you on Monday, you knew that I wouldn't be saying anything new for nine days. Now that doesn't mean a license not to come to class or pay attention or to sleep through class, but what it hopefully means is as you practice these, you know, you've got lots of, lots of times. I hope, hopefully you will feel when you get into this test that you had a lot of time to, to work these out. <laughs> so I'm going to turn over here to what chapter is this? Uh, eight and go to number, number five here and say let's give number five a try. I don't think this one has any friction yet. I'm not sure. I'll read it here in a second. But one of the things I do want you to see, if not today, certainly on Monday, is this last piece that we, we haven't used yet. What about the heat energy that's, that, that's created as we, as we move along here? So here's number five. It says, a block of mass 0.25 kilograms is placed on top of a light vertical spring with a spring constant of 5,000 newtons per meter. It is then pushed downward so that the spring is compressed 0.1 meters. After the block is released from rest, it travels upward, then it leaves the spring to what maximum height above the point of release does the block travel? Okay? Well, again, like all these, read it through the first time, draw yourself a picture, and see what you, you have here. All right, so chapter 8, number 5, says a block of mass 0.25 kilograms. All right, so here's my block. 0.25 kilograms, okay? It then says you're going to place this on top of a, and they even say light spring. Now they say vertical, meaning that it is labeled something like this. Or I shouldn't say labeled, but it is, but it is positioned something like this in a, in, a, in a vertical in a vertical fashion and so here's my my block okay then 
And notice, by the way, they didn't tell me how long the natural length of the spring is. But they do say you then come along and you push it downward. So if this is the bottom of it and this is the bottom of it, they say go ahead and push it down. Um, and it is pushed down so that the spring is compressed 0.1 meters. So 0.1 meters. Point 0.1 meters. Now you release the block and it is traveling upward. The question here is what maximum height above the point does it uh, rise? Above the point it is released. And so maybe if I draw another picture, the third picture would look maybe something like this, where the spring now has stretched back out and this block has risen up to some substantial height and and that's the question what is that that height how high did it did it go and so I'm gonna you know put here oh and actually maybe I should even beg this question how high measured from where the ground the edge of the spring and I think the author could be a little clearer here, but, but maybe he's clear enough. I mean, let's debate this for a moment. It says here, to what maximum height above the point of release does it rise? So is the point of release here? Or is the point of release here? In other words, does, does he mean the point of release from your hand? Remember, your hand pushed it down and then pulled it back. So when your hand released it, of course, then it goes up and it leaves the spring. You might call that a release. Which does he mean? Well, I got to admit, he's probably not pretty uh, clear, except he does say this. And so this is, when I read it a second time, I said, you know what? I think he means my hand. Because if you look at his words, he says after the block is released from rest. So he uses the word release for the hand. Then he goes on to say it travels upward and then leaves the spring. So leave goes with the spring. <laughs> release goes with the hand. Then he goes on to say to what maximum height above the point of release is it. So I think he really means this point here. So let me call that H. What height? All right. Uh, and maybe I should ask you, does that seem like a fair way of interpreting the question? I, I, I think that that's the best I can get out of it. And of course, we can get into the debate on whether he does or not, but at some point we just need to pick one. So I just wanted to pause and say, let's just have a uniform agreement. That's what he meant. Uh, and let's calculate it from there. Whether you think he meant that or not, I, that's just the way to do it. I would want to say this, though. You ever find yourself on a test like that, please ask. You know, uh, I will answer any question that is clarifying the question. I won't answer the question on the test. <laughs> but I, I will answer any question you have about clarifying the question. You know, it's just w what did you mean by, by this? Okay. So I think that's what he means. But I'll pause. Got the idea? Good physical picture of what's going on. I think I left off the spring constant. I know that was listed in here somewhere. He said, yeah, the spring constant is 5,000 newtons per meter. So over here I have K as 5,000 newtons per meter. Okay. And so there's my, my spring constant. And then to what maximum height does it rise? Now, again, we're in chapter 8. I'm sure you're knowing and thinking. Chapter 8, conservation of energy, it's got to be, but on a test, it's not so obvious. On a test, we have half of them are conservation of energies, and half of them are going to be Newton's second law. And on the final exam, ooh, 
Some of them will be energy. Some of them will be Newton's laws. Some of them will be linear momentum. Some of them will be angular momentum. Some of them will be fluid dynamics. So you got to know which you're picking. So I've said it a number of times. Probably don't need to say it anymore. How would I know to use work and energy here? What do I know? Forces and distance. The key is that distance. They go together. Yeah. On the test, if there's multiple like ways you can do it, is there like one way you are you going to say which way you want us to do it, or like will we not get full credit if we do it a different way? Um. What? Well, okay. Let me answer that in multiple ways. Uh. I usually don't say which way to do it. It's rare for me to do it, but I have done it in the past. So with that, any way you do it, as long as you do it right, is, is fine. Uh, usually one way is a lot easier than the other. And uh, so when I'm grading along, you know, I see, oh, they didn't do it this way. Well, let's see how they did it. And if they got it all right, I usually get, you know, I do give full credit. So if I don't say, either way is fine. I would encourage you to make sure you recognize both so you don't spend a long time on that problem and then get another one wrong. So even if you got it right, you may lose points on another one because you spent so much time on there. Now, the exception may be if I tell you to use energy and you don't use energy, then I would take some points off. But like I said, it's, it's rare for me to do that. I, I, I don't usually do that, but, uh, and it, you know. If I don't say it, then it certainly is your choice. I think that's more than fair. Okay, so coming back to this problem, I am going to put energy on here. And I'll put initial and initial and final and final and then any heat. But again, we still don't have any heat. There's no friction involved there. So let me just cross that term off. We haven't, we haven't seen that one quite yet. This one is pretty much identical to the pinball one. It's got kinetic energy, spring potential energy, gravitational potential energy. Again, it's the same reason I, I picked it because I just go, okay, we, we should probably do this one again. The more time we spend on it, the, the more it makes, makes sense. In fact, I'm kind of hoping about this point in the lecture that you're beginning to see, isn't this just the same problem? Aren't these just beginning to look the same? And I hate to say it this way, but I, I hope I'm getting even to the point that you're, you're bored. And not that I want you to be bored in class, but when you begin to see, isn't there just conservation of energy here? Isn't there just that for the answer for all the homework problems? Yes, exactly. That's what I want you to see. Yes, the problem may change. It may have a spring that's vertical or a horizontal and vertical. Maybe it'll be at an angle. Maybe it'd be two objects or three objects moving. And we haven't done multiple objects. That's also coming up here next. But once you begin to see, it's just the same fundamental idea. You begin to believe what I'm saying here when you read across the top of your syllabus. And you'll see that on your test every time. You'll go, oh, there it is again. Yeah, some simple principles here. You know? And you'll just see that same thing again and again and again. Just apply that same basic principle. The deductive reasoning can be hard. They can be different for each problem. But the fundamental idea is the same. So that's what we've been doing. Every problem I've done has started off with, with, with this. And uh, we just fill it in. I guess we kind of use that work energy theorem on the first one. But if it wasn't the work energy theorem, then it was the conservation of energy. All right. So let me put this in. All right. So as I put this in here, um, we too have that judgment call to make. Where do you want to call y equals to zero? I'll put it in blue. Yeah, personally, I really like the lowest point. Doesn't have to be, right? Anywhere you want will work, guarantee it. But I wouldn't call it here. And I think there's a natural human tendency to call y equals to zero here or even y equals zero to the ground. And all that does is add up extra variables in my equation. Doing it here means that when I start at my initial spot, that is zero. And then everything is positive from them. So I think that's a, a, a good place to, to call y equals to zero for, for this problem. Because when I do that, I can look at the initial right here and say, okay, right here, this is when my hand has pushed down on it. What is the kinetic energy? Zero. What is the gravitational potential energy? Zero. 
right? This would be your mgy. And putting y equals to zero right there means your initial potential energy is equal to zero. But there is some energy. Energy in what form? The spring, our elastic energy. And so I need to put in my one half, my k. So there's one half times 5,000. And my distance is? Where do you want to define x equal to zero? Yeah, you can't. It's been defined for you. And that natural length is back here. So the x equals to zero is here. And so it has been compressed 0.1. And if you would prefer to call it a negative 0.1, feel free. But this is square. So which way is positive, which way is negative. It doesn't, doesn't really matter for, for that one. So there is the first part of it. And again, like I did on the last one, I'm just kind of curious how much energy this is to kind of get me started. So 1 half times 5,000 times 0.1 squared should be, oh, I guess I didn't need a calculator for that one, 25. That's a hundredth and half of that. Okay. So 25 joules is what we start off in terms of, of energy. Okay. And so there it is. Where does it go? Well, now we'll flip to the other side. It then goes shooting up. And obviously it has some kinetic energy here, but how much does it have here? Zero. So on this side of the equation, I can just put a zero. And so one other reason I picked this one is I just wanted to make it very clear. Did, did I have to calculate the speed here to then go to here? No. So don't, don't make this hard on yourself. Uh, most of you caught that warning on the first test about the ball going up, but many of you didn't. I mean, the ball goes up, then the ball comes down. Do you have to calculate how high it goes up here? Not in the projectile motion. You can go from beginning to end. It has a constant acceleration during our projectile motion. Same thing here. Do you need to calculate the energy somewhere in between? No, I see it a lot though. Students will take some time to calculate this, only to calculate this. I would say the energy is the same everywhere, right? That's what's meant by conservation of energy. In fact, that's why we do the lab on Monday. Uh, hopefully you will enjoy the lab. You have this little block that you let go down. And at the same time, another block is going up. But the idea is you measure the energy here, 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 here. And you measure the energy about well, as fast as that computer measures it, it measures it like 100 times a second, and it takes about two seconds. So you probably measure the energy 200 times. And you have different potential energies, you have different kinetic energies, but the point of the lab is to get you to add those together and see what is the total here, 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 here. And every time you're going to have 200 pieces of measurement of energy, and you will see it's the same. Here, 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 and you'll get exactly the same amount of energy 200 times when you measure this with the, with the computer on Monday. Emphasizing the same idea that the energy is the same no matter where you do it. So no point in breaking it in the middle unless you need to know some information about the middle. We don't. It makes it easier. I never need to figure out what the speed is. It's not relevant. It starts at speed zero and finishes at speed zero. And if you catch that, it becomes an easy problem. And so don't do it in between. So I wanted, to, I wanted you to see that. All right, well, let me keep going. That's the kinetic energy. Then we can come over here to the potential energy. And I would say it is an mg. Um, and maybe I even should put in my m. Do they tell me my m? Yeah. So the m is 0.25 kilograms. My g is 9.8 meters per second squared. And then my y, well, that's what they're looking for, right? So that is how high from the point of release. And the, if the point of release is here, that's what they are looking for. So this is my h here. And so doing a little arithmetic here, taking the 25 and dividing it by the 0.25 and then dividing it by the 9.8, is about a 10.2 meters. And so that's how high 
this one goes, which is pretty high. 10 meters here. So, but maybe not too much of a surprising. This is a pretty strong spring. You're shooting it up here. And it's only 250 grams, so it's going to go racing up to the, to the top. Ah, well, let's try another one. How about number seven here? Number seven looks almost identical. The numbers are a little bit bigger because uh, we don't have a lab this big. But number seven is exactly the uh, setup that you're going to see in Monday's lab. You're going to take a pulley and hook some weights. and One's going to go down and one's going to come up. And the reason I picked this one, partly because it's in the lab and I wanted you to see it. It's also why I picked it for the lab, because I want you to, to deal with it. But also partly because it involves two objects. And, and we haven't done that yet. This doesn't have any friction yet. But we haven't been working with multiple objects. And this is a good example of multiple, multiple objects. Because, again, the principle is conservation of energy. So can the kinetic energy change? You sure? I mean, don't we have conservation of energy? Doesn't that say the kinetic energy can't change? Right. There is no such thing as conservation of kinetic energy. It's conservation of energy. Meaning, for example, as I drop this, it has no kinetic energy here, and it increases as it goes down. Does the kinetic energy change? Oh, yes. But then, so does the potential energy. But the total of the two doesn't. Now, what if this object were to hit another object? Could the energy from this get transferred to this? Yeah, so again, this principle of conservation of energy, we need to take carefully. We're not saying any one individual energy is conserved. We're saying all the energy of all the objects is conserved. And so as things work on each other, bump into each other, tie to each other, Objects can change the type of energy they have. They can also transfer their energy from one object to another. So we got to keep track of all objects. And I guess we kind of did that back with the railroad cart. Didn't we have two springs? And so we had those two terms, a one-half kx squared for the first spring and a one-half kx squared for the second spring. And so as we have multiple objects, wouldn't we have like a one-half mv squared for the first object and another one-half mv squared for the second object. So that's what this one is illustrating. Watch. Let me read it. It's, it's, it's number seven. Like I said, very similar to the lab you will do. It says, two objects are connected by a light spring passing over a light frictionless pulley shown in figure seven. The object of mass five kilograms is released from rest. Now, maybe I should draw the picture over here so you guys can kind of analyze it here. Here's the pulley. It's kind of got a gear system and it's tied to the ceiling, something like this. But the string comes around the pulley and we have five kilograms hanging from it. Like I said, that's a little much for our lab. We're not going to be hanging five kilograms of weight here. And uh, the other side, or maybe I should say five kilograms of mass, is three kilograms sitting, <laughs> three kilograms sitting down here on the, on the floor. And the diagram goes to show here that the height is four meters. Okay, and again, we don't have that much room in our lab to work with here. So these are a lot bigger numbers than you're going to have. But you're going to have hundreds of grams, and you're going to have one meter, and you're going to make this thing go, go up and down. Okay. Well, let me keep reading. Watch, I'll start over again. Two objects connected by a light string passing over a light frictionless pulley. So no friction yet. Shown in the figure. The object of five kilograms is released from rest. Using conservation of energy, A, determine the speed of the three kilogram object just as the five kilogram object hits the ground. And then B, find the maximum height to which the three kilogram object rises. So there's two parts to it. But before we even get too much into the, to the uh, 
details of the question. Let's just make sure we've got a good physical picture of this and an understanding of what's going to happen. I, I, I think you see this part. You've got some weights. You've got a heavier one here. I mean, if you let this go, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, I mean, this is like the problems we were doing in chapter uh, 5, where, where this one's going to go down because you have a gravitational force greater than the tension. And if this was a chapter 5 problem, it would probably say, find the tension in the cord connecting the two, two weights together. Or find the acceleration of the 3 kilogram block. So, so we did a lot of those. And that, that's not quite what we're, we're, we're after here. Uh, this one is saying, though, find the speed. But it's not asking for the acceleration and it's not asking for the tension. So I'm not going to do it by Newton's laws. I'm going to do it by work and energy. Do I know distance? Yes. Do I know forces? Yes. And what you hopefully notice here is I never really have to find out what the acceleration is. I, I never have to find out what the tension in the, in the cord is. I, I, I don't need it. Could I get it? Yes. I would even say it's a harder problem. This is really your question earlier. You said, look, couldn't I do this by either method I want? Yeah. Uh, but I would say getting the acceleration and finding the speed is possible, but a lot more work than, than just do it by energy here. And so these are the ones that you were asking and I said, I just, yeah, I usually don't say anything. I say, hey, give me the speed. And if you want to do it by energy, it's a short problem. You want to do it with acceleration and tension, it's a long problem. You can get it right, but it's a lot more work. And it may hurt you on the end, the last problem, when you get to the last problem and you're out of time, going, I didn't have enough time to finish the test. So. A, g a good choice here on which method is, is important. So I just want to come back to the question. It said, determine the speed of the three. Yeah, okay, so it's the three you want right as the five is hitting the ground. Okay, so again, you get this idea, I think, here, that this one comes down and this one goes up. Okay, and of course, eventually, this one's going to hit the ground. So this one has moved four meters. This one has gone up. Four meters. So there's an important connection to make. And so when they make contact, and maybe I'll change colors here so we can draw the see before and after, but we're looking at this. So this is what I would call the, the final position. The five being down here and the three now being up here. And so the cord now looks something like like that. And so what is this this speed when that one first makes contact with the ground. Okay. How fast is it is it going? Yeah. Now, I guess I should make this clear too, because this is kind of like our lab one, but our lab one I think is even better. Because you're gonna measure the energy here and here and here. In here, in here, and as I said, you're going to measure this energy about 200 times before you get all the way down to here. We won't want me to do that. They're not asking us for anything in between. But the whole idea here of the lab and of this chapter is, isn't the energy the same all the way down? So can I say the beginning, the initial is the same as the end, the final? And so that's where I'll begin. So initial energy, kinetic, initial potential equals final kinetic, final potential, and any heat that's created along in the, in the process. Now again, really haven't done any heat yet, so we'll get to those. Looks like we won't get those to today, but uh, we will on, on, on Monday. Fortunately, they're not too hard here. But what I did want you to see in this is the multiple objects here. So let me start off. This first question is, what's the kinetic energy? Well, don't they say this one starts at rest? But that also tells you something about this one. What's this one? It starts at rest. So I need to put a zero for each of them. And that's really the point of this problem. What do you do if you have multiple objects? Well, add up the energies of each object. Each object has a kinetic. In this case, they're both zero. Same thing can be said about the next line. What about the potential energy? And it'll be okay if I just put a little G under here because the only potential energy relevant for this problem is G. No springs here, right? So I don't need to even think about the spring potential energy. But of course, every time we get to gravitational potential energy and we start using this equation 
mgy, we have to pause and say, where do you want to call y equals to zero? It, it hasn't been really chosen yet. So make that choice somewhere in the problem. Any suggestions? Yeah, this one is probably the easiest one and most people would pick the ground without debate or without thinking and, and, and it is. I do think it's the, the best one. Uh, and again, because it's the lowest point, so that means everything's positive, but that's not the main reason. The main reason is this one starts at zero, this one finishes at zero. It's nice to have a bunch of zeros in an equation. They keep the equation simpler. So look at what's going on and choose your y equal to zero uh, appropriately. I mean, you could argue y equal to zero here, too, would be kind of nice mathematically, but then we have also negative values, and so I'm like, no, nah, I'm not real crazy about that. Okay, so then as we jump over here and actually do uh, these, again, want to emphasize, don't we have to do it twice? Don't we have two objects as part of our system? So, what's the gravitational potential energy of the three? Zero. And then gravitational potential energy of the five? would be its mass times g times its height of 4. And maybe just for fun I'll ask, wait a minute, is it 4 from the bottom of the object? Top of the object? Middle of the object? Okay, so we can answer it in a couple ways. A, Keep it consistent is probably the best answer because yes, if you are calling the ground zero, you are measuring the bottom of the object, so I should continue to do the bottom of the object. I'll do you one better. Remember, our objects don't have size yet. Right? That's after this next task. We give them size so that we can start talking about center of mass, momentum, and rotations. Okay, and so all that's coming up. So this is about the time in the chapter where our semester where students start out. Well, what about the top of the object? What good questions. Haven't even dealt with them yet. Okay, those are coming up. All right, but probably just to say the bottom of the object. And I brought it up, number one, to help you think about what we have done and what we haven't done and what we will do. But number two is you'll be faced with that realistic question in the lab. And so I'll say the same thing in the lab. Do the bottom of it. Be consistent with the bottom. Using the ground as the bottom. I mean using the ground as zero means you're measuring the bottom. So be consistent with that when you, when you measure up here. All right, so there's the first part. And like I've done in the other problems, I'm just kind of always curious. I, I, I don't really know why, but I like to just know how much energy am I working with? This, this is what I have to work with. It's, it's like getting my paycheck at the end of the week. Okay, this is what I have for the week. Well, what do I have this week? And uh, just kind of focus on that. Am I going to make the rent payment? You know, like, oh, I better save half of this for rent here coming up. So this is 196 joules. So there's the... There's the first part of it. That's how much energy we, we, we have to work with. Then, of course, what happens is it moves. And so it begins to do something like this, like this, like this, like this, like this, like this. So now let's call this the final spot, the blue. All right, let's go to kinetic energy. Wouldn't I have the three kilogram object moving? In fact, that's really what the question is. The question says, hey, what is the speed? So, so this object has come up to here and it's moving with some V speed. So when I go to calculate its kinetic energy, it would be one half times its mass times its speed squared. But what about the other object? Okay, so the other object, I need to think about its kinetic energy also. Now, is it moving? Is it speed zero? Yeah, right before it hits the ground, it's moving, right? Then it hits the ground, and now it's not moving. So what do I do? Well, if I look at this equation, and nowhere in this equation does it have the force from the ground, wouldn't that be part of the work done on the object? So I can't actually do this problem thinking of it after it's hit the ground, can I? 
I have not included the force of the ground into my equation. I don't know what it is. Now, maybe I could, but my point is, I want you to see here how you would know to make that decision. And that decision really is saying, does it have a speed? Yes, it has a speed. Its speed is the speed momentarily before it hits the ground. How do I know it would be the speed right before the ground, not a speed of zero? Because if it's going to be the speed of zero, then what made it zero was a force from the ground. So I have to include that into my energy equation, and I haven't done that. I guess that's where this heat would come into play. That's the molecules hitting themselves and making the molecules go faster. And so by making this statement, by saying there's no heat, I am saying I'm not talking about the collision part on the ground. And there's my deductive reasoning. I know what to do. I can reason out why I can do it and why I can't do it. Right? All right, so I and I go one step further. How does this speed here compare to that speed? Yeah. Are they the same? Yeah, good. They are the same. And I have my two terms. Well, we'll wrap this up here in a second. What about the gravitational potential energy? Yeah, this one is now at a height of 4. So this will be my M, my G, and my H, and the other one will be 0. So there's the equation. The only, only unknown is V. Plug it in. Get an answer. All right? Well, we'll do more on Monday. Uh, let me say one more thing. I know this is a long class, two hours, and especially when we're doing example problems, if you already know how to do this. If you got to go to the bathroom, especially if you're not sick, I understand that. But there's doors here in the back. Let's go around that way through the doors here. It kind of like breaks our concentration as we're moving along here. So door in the back, go around behind, bathroom's over here, or go around that side, okay? And so just kind of focus on that door during class. All right. <laughs>